All right. Um, welcome. Our first speaker today is Matt Chung. He's talking about hacking on multi-party computation. It's okay to take pictures of the speaker for this talk. Give it up for Matt Chung. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about my experience with multi-party computation. Um, this is something that I first encountered about six years ago, and I don't know. I thought it was a really cool topic, and wanted to share it with you guys. So, uh, sort of, what is multi-party computation? Well, the idea is that you might have multiple parties that want to uh, that have private inputs to a function, but they want to jointly compute that function without revealing what it is they're computing. And I don't know. When I first heard this, I don't know that sounded like magic. But of course, it's just math, right? Which to some people might be just as good as magic. Um, so, a little bit of history. One of the first problems that was posed um, in the area of multi-party computation is called the millionaire's problem. And I guess nowadays it'd probably be the billionaire's problem because millionaire—that's no big deal now, right? Um, so the idea is that you have two millionaires that want to compare their net worth, but they don't want to reveal what that net worth is. So um, how can they uh, determine who is the winner in that uh, without um, revealing it? And so um, the answer that was first developed was uh, to use something called garbled circuits. That's a pretty fancy name, but uh, basically it takes a, a Boolean circuit and turns it into some sort of encrypted Boolean circuit. And we'll see a little bit about how they do that. But first, um, one of the, the key concepts um, in order to, to make this work is called oblivious transfer. And so the idea here, and this is, I think, one of the first things I was like, well, this is magic, uh, is that say I'm, uh, I have two pieces of information and uh, you want to request one of them without telling me which one you requested, um, and I want to send it to you, but without revealing the one that you didn't request. And so um, that's what Oblivious Transfer does. It allows you to request a piece of information and only get back what you requested without telling me which one you requested. Um, and this is just like in more formal language what that is. Um, OK, so what is the whole garbled circuit protocol. Um, so first, you have to take your function and describe it as a Boolean circuit. So in the case of a, uh, the millionaire's problem, you want to create the greater than com comparator operator uh, in terms of a Boolean circuit. And then, of course, this is a cryptography. So our, our two players in this protocol are Alice and Bob. And so Alice garbles or encrypts the circuit. And she sends this garbled circuit to Bob along with her encrypted inputs. Bob receives the encrypted uh, um, inputs and does a oblivious transfer to get his encrypted uh, outputs. Or sorry, you get the uh, encrypted uh, inputs through oblivious transfer. Um, Bob then evaluates the circuit and then uh, they need to, he needs to com uh, communicate back with Alice to determine what the output of the function is. And this can either be done by um, just having Alice find out what the answer is, or they could share the answer. But um, this allows evaluation of essentially arbitrary Boolean circuits, but it is um, relatively so. It requires a lot of communication. Um, so a different uh, mechanism for uh, doing this kind of multi-party computation is what's known as homomorphic encryption. And this is something that uh, was observed early on with one of the first public key crypto systems, RSA. Um, and uh, there was, it was observed that RSA exhibits a multiplicatively homomorphic property. Um, also, another encryption scheme, which isn't quite as widely used, but um, was defined uh, about the same time, was uh, Algamal. So they both have this multiplicative property. And just to give a brief overview of this, 
Um, so uh, briefly, an RSA public key is um, a pair of numbers N and E, and uh, I'm not, without getting into the details about how uh, about E and everything, um, N is a product of two large primes, P and Q, and to encrypt a message, we simply raise, well, we view the message as a number from uh, zero to N and uh, raise M to the eth power. And it was observed that if you take the ciphertext of two, of the, two ciphertexts and you multiply them together, just because of the way that multiplying uh, two numbers with raise to the same power works, that's the same thing as encrypting the product. So um, you have this property. You can, I could give you two, uh, or you could give me um, two values that have been encrypted with RSA. I can just multiply them together and give that back to you, and then that's the, um, an encryption of the, the product of the original numbers. Now, this is, uh, again, with unpadded uh, RSA, like sort of the textbook RSA, but uh, it's an interesting property to observe. Algamal um, is uh, a different scheme that um, isn't as widely used, but um, and I'm glossing over a bunch of details here, but um, the main uh, point is that there's a, a public key that specifies a prime number, um, and oh, I guess there should also be a generator there, and a um, public value Y, and to encrypt, uh, each time that somebody encrypts a message, they generate a random number R, uh, raise G to the Rth power, mod P, and multiply the message M by Y to the Rth power. And just like with RSA, this has a multiplicative property. If you do component-wise multiplication, um, the, in the first component, the exponents add, but that's just another G to random number. And uh, in the second component, you have the M1 and M2 multiplied together times Y to that same random number that G is being raised to. So um, it's, uh, again, multiplicatively homomorphic. But uh, something that's perhaps a little bit more useful, uh, and at least something that I actually had used before, was additively homomorphic encryption schemes. So, whoa, that's loud. Um, the, First one is uh, additive Elgamal. So we could actually modify the Elgamal scheme that we saw before to produce an additively homomorphic scheme. Um, and then there's also Pi A, which um, actually works out a little bit better. But we'll start off with additive Elgamal. So this just requires a uh, slight tweak to the original scheme. So instead of um, multiplying just by the message, we're going to raise. Uh, the generator g to the mth power, uh, and then uh, when we multiply component-wise, the addition will happen in the exponent. And um, though there is a little bit of a problem with this scheme, in that when you try to do the decryption, you'll do the same process as you do normally, where what you do to decrypt is raise the uh, first component, that's the g, to the x power. That's the private key. And um, that will give you uh, the y to the r1 plus r2. And then you can compute its inverse, do that multiplication, and you're left with g to the m1 plus m2. And that is not easy to come up with because, in fact, the entire security around the scheme is that it's hard to determine what the exponent is given the, just the number. So um, that's what's referred to as the discrete log problem. Um, but there's still useful cases for this. Um, Pi A, on the other hand, okay, this is a much longer key generation scheme. Um, it uses uh, in like an RSA style modulus, um, and a bunch of technical details here that um, just having for your sake. But I don't think that I really need to talk about all the details. Um, Feedback. Okay, so, um, but 
the upshot of all this, so this is the encryption uh, algorithm, and then to decrypt, uh, it has this nice property that, uh, okay, just going back, you see that just like with the additive alchemal, the message goes in the exponent of this G value, and so when you multiply ciphertext together, uh, you'll have that additive property, but um, this essentially allows you to complete discre compute discrete logs uh, easily if you have the private key information. Um, so, uh, so far I've just talked about a multiplicatively homomorphic scheme or an additively homomorphic scheme, but um, what would be really nice is to be able to do both or have a fully homomorphic scheme, so have it so that it um, can be add, um, compute addition and multiplication on the ciphertext. Um, it turns out that uh, so this, is, this was, I think, first accomplished in 2009 by Craig Gentry. And what he did was um, he used this lattice based encryption scheme um, that was somewhat homomorphic, somewhat fully homomorphic. And what that means is that um, you can do addition and multiplication up, up to a point. Uh, in particular, you can evaluate <coughs> polynomials up to a certain degree. And it turns out that with his scheme, um, you could write the decryption circuit in terms of uh, this, um, uh, in terms of polynomial that's small enough so that you can uh, sort of decrypt while uh, homomorphically uh, and then do one more operation. So um, this, you can sort of imagine this as you have like two locked boxes, one inside of the other, and what, you're able to unlock the inner box without having to unlock the outer box. Um, so that's uh, how that works. I, currently, it's still pretty slow. I know that there have been some improvements, but um, it's generally a, a pretty slow procedure. Um, now, this is a, uh, so there was actually a tool that I've used in, in the past, um, although it was pretty tricky to get to work, but um, it's the tool for automating secure two-party computation, or TASTY for short. Um, and the, the language for it was a Python-like language. Um, and what you do is specify what the client and server operations are, and it would compile Two, two separate binaries, a client and server, for you. Um, and it actually supported both additively homomorphic encryption and garbled circuits. So you could actually combine those two operations into a single protocol. Um, so one example of how this might be useful is, um, say, uh, this is an example I can think of that uh, in machine learning, uh, oftentimes, uh, when you're doing some, like say, a classification uh, procedure, you, after you've trained your algorithm, you have some, some vector that um, represents uh, information about your, what um, your algorithm is trained. Um, and this may be some sort of proprietary information that you don't want to share. Um, and correspondingly, somebody who might want to uh, run their information against your uh, classifier doesn't want to actually share the information. So what you could do is um, the client could encrypt their, uh, their information that would go into the algorithm and submit it. And on the server side, they uh, keep the uh, vector in plain text. And uh, with an additively homomorphic scheme, you can compute the inner product of two vectors um, where one is encrypted and the other is just a plain text vector, because um, if you multiply a an encrypted number by an encrypted value by just a number, um, then that just works like uh, the way that you would think about from grade school how multiplication works, right? Where you define multiplication as repeated addition, so you can do the same thing with an additively homomorphic scheme. So uh, you could first do that to come up with a, um, a value, and then um, what you often have to do is compare that to 
whether or not uh, it's greater than or less than a particular value. So you could then use a garbled circuit to uh, compare the uh, resulting value with what uh, the algorithm wants. So um, it's it was difficult to use. I found I, I think I was only able to get this thing to work using Gentoo uh, and a lot of painful work. Um, but uh, part of the the point of this talk was to show that uh, there are actually some tools out there where you can start playing with these kinds of um, algorithms and techniques. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a detour from um, the hardcore computational aspects and uh, talk a little bit about zero knowledge proofs. So I'm going to like speed run through um, a blog posting by Matthew Green. I'm really cribbing this section from his blog post. Um, he wrote uh, an awesome blog he, uh, I have listed in the references slide um, that explains uh, what zero knowledge is all about. And so the, the main idea behind it is that um, I want to convince somebody that I know some information, uh, but without revealing what that information is. And we're going to go through a particular example that he went through um, in his blog posting. Um, and there, so there are three properties of zero knowledge. Completeness, that means that if I actually know the information that I'm trying to prove, then I can uh, prove it to you. Soundness means that, in fact, I can only convince you that I know the answer if I do know the answer to the problem. And the zero knowledge is the, the part where you're not able to extract information about the solution uh, from my proof. Uh, so the example Matthew Green gave was uh, a graph tree coloring problem. So um, he, he picked Google. He said, like, so maybe um, some customer comes to Google and says, I want you to use all of your computational power to find a three coloring of a graph. Uh, and this could be useful for uh, cell phone providers to make sure that they're not overlapping frequencies of cell towers. Um, but Google doesn't want to do all this work and then uh, just give it away. And likewise, their client's not going to, doesn't want to pay for it unless they are actually sure that Google did the problem, right? So um, you have some graph here, and you have to make sure that uh, you can find colorings so that with only three colors, so that no two colors share an edge. So here's an example coloring of that graph. But again, uh, and this is a small graph, so this is, is one that uh, would be fairly easy to just do by hand. But imagine you have a much larger one. Um, now, uh, Google wants to hide all information, so it's going to put hats all on, on top of its graph. You imagine that uh, they have this big room with the, the graph laid out. and Underneath, it, it's colored, but they're going to cover it up with hats. And what they're going to do to prove that they've solved the problem is say to the customer, I'll let you pick two hats and to reveal what colors they are. Um, and if the customer does this enough times, they will ultimately be convinced that Google did actually do the three coloring. Um, so they pick up those two, and they see, OK, Node 7 is purple, and node 8 is blue. But um, one thing that Google doesn't want, want, so the client's like, OK, well, I might have just gotten lucky that one time. I, I want you to prove it to me by letting me do it more times. But if we just left the coloring the same, then they could learn most of the coloring and maybe even be able to figure out the rest of it uh, on their own. So what Google does is each time the customer picks up those two hats and puts them back down, they randomly recolor it, um, but still making it a valid three coloring. Uh, and so no information about which colors were in the uh, first try will help somebody on the second try learning more information about um, the three coloring. Or at least that's what we hope for. Um, and so um, the, I, I hope it, it's fairly clear that the completeness and soundness portion um, should be fairly clear here. The interesting thing is, how do we know that this is really not leaking any information about the three coloring? Um, and so 
that's where the, the, the blog post was uh, really informative for me was that um, it illustrates that the way that you have to think about it is how could you cheat this protocol? And so uh, Matthew Green's solution was time machines. So um, yeah, now what does he mean by that? Well, suppose that Google was cheating and just came up with a random coloring. And any time they got caught, they hop into a DeLorean, go back in time, and change the, the, the coloring. Um, because like, they know which two hats they're going to be picking. So they're like, all right, we're just going to make sure that those two are, are colors are different. Um, now, uh, it turns out that this procedure would be indistinguishable from if they had actually done it correctly. Um, so the point being that if the customer was able to figure out information about the three coloring from this protocol, then they would have been able to do it from the cheating protocol with the time machine. But that was garbage. So that's the, the general idea of the proof of that um, they're not able to extract it when it's actually done correctly. So um, this is, again, another tool um, developed by uh, the folks at JHU and Matthew Green in particular, um, which I haven't had a chance to play with yet, but I've been meaning to. Uh, it's um, called Charm, and it supports a number of crypto primitives, uh, including, uh, as it says here, like some, some basic massings, rings and fields, uh, elliptic curves, uh, and uh, zero knowledge proofs, all that kind of good stuff. So um, something to take a look at. So why did he go off on this zero knowledge stuff? Well, there are two uh, security models for uh, these protocols. Uh, there's honest but curious and then the malicious model. And um, honest but curious is what you might think. It's just, I'm going to run through the protocol correctly, and I want to get information about um, what uh, the other person had put into it. but. I'm not going to try and cheat. And the malicious one is, I'm going to try and cheat as much as I can. And you have to try and catch me. And um, so that's where the zero knowledge proofs come in, is that the zero knowledge proofs are used to detect cheating and allow somebody to abort if the cheating is detected. And um, so I'm going to briefly talk about, uh, like really briefly talk about this protocol that um, I helped uh, do some implementation work with um, six years ago. Um, it's called, it was a secure text pattern matching algorithm called 5PM. And um, I'll briefly illustrate, this is the sort of insecure version of it. The idea behind this protocol is that um, you set up these what are called character delay vectors that tell you that if a letter in the, the pattern that you're looking for is found, now let's just assume that we found it in our pattern, how, might, how many steps further would we have to go before we reach the end of the pattern? And we put a one there. And um, so that's what the, the uh, vectors over on the left are. And we just go through the text on the server side, and we add and shift down. And um, we can use an additively homomorphic encryption scheme to replace, the, replace this insecure version with a version that operates on encrypted data. And um, so you can use PIA or additive algamol, elliptic curve algamol. Um, and uh, that's how the, the honest but curious version works. In the malicious model, um, we use a couple of things. One thing is called threshold encryption, which allows uh, the two players to jointly come up with an encryption uh, key that they will then use to uh, encrypt both of their inputs. They actually swap, both go through um, that same uh, text search protocol um, using some linear algebra, and then they use zero knowledge proofs to detect if one or the other is cheating and, and abort uh, in that case. And so I'll quickly conclude with saying that um, cryptography generally um, is kind of about uh, any time that you want, you wish you had some third, trusted third party who could handle information for you. Uh, we're going to use cryptography to do that instead. And there are some tools out there that you can try to use. Um, you can try to use some of your own implementations. I actually just recently sort of redid the honest but curious version of that protocol in Python, like during a hackathon at night, really quick. Um, but of course, don't rely on anything that's not been verified. 
And uh, with that, there are some references, uh, but I'll be releasing the slides uh, after the talk. So, uh, and I'll tweet about that at, the, at Crypto Village. So I think I'm just out of time. So thank you. <laughs>